Imagine yourself in a cement corridor. The smell of mold and old chalk fills your nostrils as the cell phone in your hand sheds a dim light around you. Somewhere ahead, you hear a groaning noise and the sound of feet scraping along the floor, slowly getting louder and louder. The shovel in your other hand is heavy, but you know you can swing it if someone does the unthinkable. Can you picture this scene in your mind? Do you know what you'd do in a situation like this? If so, you might have what it takes to be a gamer. My name is Jeffrey Smith. I've been a gamer since 1978, and this is the story of the gamer evolution. Some people think of gamers as fans of the Xbox, PlayStation 3, or the Wii. Some conjure up images of people involved in online role-playing games. But gamers were around long before there were video games like we know them today. In fact, gamers have been around since the 1970s, although no one called them that at first. It began with a game published in a pamphlet, then as a book, and then a starter box set, Dungeons & Dragons, or simply D&D. The person running the game, called the Dungeon Master, describes the plot and events in the game to the players, who respond not as themselves, but as their characters. They play a role, much like an actor does on stage or in a film. The game itself, like most games, has rules to follow and uses dice to add an element of random chance to keep events exciting and unpredictable. These types of games require the use of imagination, problem-solving skills, the ability to visualize abstract concepts, group communication talents, and leadership abilities. And that's all pretty positive, but the common perception of a gamer isn't. The question is, why? It all has to do with public perception. Dr. Danilo Janish, associate professor at the School of Urban Affairs at the University of Delaware, believes that part of the problem is how news, especially local television news, creates a skewed vision of reality. News is a construction. Journalists often make an observation in the world and they form an angle. If you have an angle, then what happens is that you, you um, include certain facts and certain approaches to things and you leave others out. You have to get as much quick information as you can so you, so you, so you go to stereotypes, uh, you go to uh, tried and true approaches to things. These stories are being pitched for the most part to news directors. And so in order to get on the air, you report the stories that make sure you get there. And if scaring the hell out of somebody, pardon my language, is the way you do it, because that's how, you know, that, that's how, that's how you, you get folks watching. Since news media focuses primarily on extreme examples, only the worst extremes tend to be included in local newscasts, causing a skewed and potentially negative view of the subject or event in the public's mind. Dr. Leslie Withers, from the Communication and Dramatic Arts Department at Central Michigan University, remembers when D&D first became popular in her school. And the teachers loved it. The teachers thought, hey, you've got this group of, of boys that normally be running around, uh, getting into trouble, causing mischief. And instead, they're huddled around this table in the corner and, and staying fairly quiet and out of trouble. They, they thought that was great. Through the 70s and into the 80s, if you weren't familiar with Dungeons & Dragons, you may have thought that the game itself, as well as the type of person who played it, was, well, strange. In 1979, a troubled 16-year-old named James Dallas Egbert III vanished into the steam tunnels at Michigan State University where he was a student. He went to try and kill himself. He also played Dungeons and Dragons. He survived, and although there was nothing in the investigation that suggested a connection between Egbert's suicide attempt and the game Dungeons and Dragons, a 1981 book and later a made-for-TV movie seemed to suggest otherwise. The book and film told the story of a college student who uses a fantasy role-playing game as a refuge from the unpleasantness of his normal life. Partway through the film, the student has a nervous breakdown and mentally becomes his game character. The result is, of course, disastrous. The thinly veiled reference to Dungeons & Dragons in the book caused the game to be falsely blamed for the near tragedy, and when the made-for-TV movie aired on CBS in 1982, that false blame went national. 
Religious groups claimed that children would be corrupted by such a game and that it encouraged fraternization with demons and devils and thus must be intimately tied to Satanism. While Dungeons and Dragons outlived the hysteria, the turmoil of the 80s would establish the stigma of the gamer. And that stigma would follow the next generation of gamers as well. In 1978, student gamers Roy Trubshaw and Richard Bartle at Essex University in England created a text-only online multiplayer fantasy role-playing game. While similar to Dungeons and Dragons, the text-only online game used computers to describe the key actions that took place in the game. Even though the text-only game was very popular, the social image of the individuals who played these games was still negative. I think there was a lot of talk about um, gaming, particularly online gaming through a mud, being addictive and a lot of concern, you know, oh, well, you wouldn't want to get involved with that because look what happened to this guy, you know, look how he's uh, become addicted and doesn't leave his room and has missed out on these experiences and um, isn't doing well in his coursework. And, so there was a lot of concern. Uh, it, it became one of those, it, people would whisper about it almost like they would about using drugs, like don't get started. Once you start, you're hooked and you can't escape. So there was definitely um, some concern in that direction that, uh, that it was addictive and dangerous. In the late 1990s, the next level of online gaming appeared, EverQuest. EverQuest was one of the first games to pair computer-run online role-playing and advanced video graphics. These games became known as Massively Multiplayer Online Games, or MMOs. The most successful MMO by far is Blizzard's World of Warcraft. Currently operating with close to 10 million paying players throughout the world, which is larger than the population of New York City, World of Warcraft is the leader in the Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Game genre and a huge financial success for Blizzard. And no wonder, MMO gaming is a big money venture. Worldwide, the MMO industry is expected to rise to over $17 billion in annual revenue by the year 2015. But thanks to continued negative attention in the media, being a gamer is still seen as something only the antisocial, the awkward, or the unemployed do, so they can avoid their day-to-day -day responsibilities and obligations. However, the reality of being a gamer bears little resemblance to the way it's portrayed in the media. Like the games themselves, gamers have evolved. And I don't know whether we can credit Revenge of the Nerds or, um, or if it was just a general change in culture as computers became more prevalent and um, more lucrative perhaps, that suddenly it didn't seem like it was such a bad thing to be interested in what had been considered you know, techy or nerdy or geeky in the past. And so as people then, as that became more accepted, then I think that some of the other activities like gaming or being interested in sci-fi books or TV shows or movies also started to become more accepted. And as people um, started to say, you know, I am a geek, I embrace this side of my, or this aspect of my personality, that, you know, that encouraged other people to kind of come out as being a geek as well. Gamers of different ethnicities, religions, genders, social groups, nationalities, and occupations gather daily to talk, to socialize, and to play. At a weekend get-together in 2008 near Dayton, Ohio, a group of gamers who, for the most part, were just meeting face-to-face -face for the first time, discussed what participating in MMOs meant to them. And it was really interesting to compare each in-game persona to the person behind it. As a gamer, my first question was why they chose to play and what they got out of it. It's a major source of entertainment for me, um, but it's also uh, when, it, when the game becomes boring and I take a break from the game, um, it's who wondering what all my friends are up to that makes me really want to log in and talk to people. Um, so it's, I think it's a big, big part of it is community and my friends that I've made from it too. In general, it's just a fun hobby. It's something I enjoy. It's a great place to go to make friends. I've made a lot of friends there. I have a good time. Um, it's just, it's a good place to wind down. Some people wind down by uh, spending time in the pool or tanning or going to a bar, but this is just my way of doing it and I enjoy it. Uh, it's a very big stress release if I've had a rough day at work. I can log on and <laughs> punch somebody in the face. <laughs> I can't do that in real life, but I can do that online. It sure makes me feel a lot better. My next question for the group was, what role did friendship play in their choice to play and to pay? 
But at the end of the day, every time, what brings me back is the people that play the game, not so much the game. Where else can you spend $14.99 and get a month's worth of enjoyment out of something and get a lot of cool friends along with it? For me, it's paramount to have uh, to have good, solid relationships with the kind of front, the kind of people you find in MMOs. Um, quite frankly, I could probably find better content single-player games out there. So I'm not really there to be impressed by the people making the game. I'm more to be impressed by the kind of relationships I can develop with those people in that game. When the conversation turned to myths and stereotypes about gamers, the group had no shortage of opinions. I think that a lot of people think that we're deadheads, that we don't have a life, that's all, that's all we do. Um, but it's, it's been proven in study after study. We have a, a, we're very intelligent individuals. We have a lot of mind-hand-eye coordination, and we stay very active in that. I think it, everybody is quick to label somebody or, you know, judge them instead of actually getting to know them. And I think if people actually took time to get to know people, they'd know that they're a lot more than what they do in their off time. As the conversation continued, several myths and stereotypes kept coming up. A stereotype is a mental shortcut. Uh, we're kind of lazy as human beings and we don't like to recreate the wheel. So we like to create a pattern or a shortcut so that when we go into a new situation, we don't have to recreate everything for that new situation. So it's a way of basically lessening our cognitive load, making it a little easier to acclimate to new situations by saying, oh, well, here's how this situation is similar to other situations I've been in. So it's really about looking for, for patterns and ways of categorizing to make our lives easier. Dr. Sherry Bleem, chair of the Communication Arts and Sciences Department at Adrian College and a gamer herself, understands the logic behind this perception. I, I think one of the dangers is, uh, to be very frank, less exercise than is necessary because to game online one must sit. Uh, and to game seriously online, one must sit many days at length. And there are plenty of different uh, uh, pastiches of this in, in different television shows, like uh, the episode where uh, the South Park uh, characters uh, sit and play for weeks or so online, and, and, and their body style changes, and I think that that's a danger. It was a danger one of the group members had experienced firsthand. When I first got into EverQuest, uh, it really destroyed my life. I was the typical overweight gamer, 540 pounds, did nothing but game, didn't sleep, just got up, logged on, played as much as I could. My job suffered that I had at the time. I didn't have anybody in my life. Um, finally, it got to the point where I tried to commit suicide because I couldn't all I ever did was play an MMO. That's all I ever did. I, the only friends I had were in-game. I never had a personal life. And it just got so bad that I ended up ODing on pills. And after that, I unplugged. I stopped playing EverQuest. I got into City of Heroes, which was a more casual game. Everything, I ended up meeting the man of my dreams, and we've been together for almost three years now, and I don't know, I get, I've get i seen the dark side of MMOs, and I've also seen the good side of it, where you meet friends and stuff. According to a 2008 study conducted by researchers from three different universities, not only are MMO players more fit than the U.S. general population, they're also older, averaging 30 years of age. Another study done by researchers at the University of Southern California agreed, finding that MMO players are 10% leaner than the average American. So the possibility exists, as Dr. Blaine points out, that anyone engaged in a largely sedentary hobby may become overweight. But many gamers seem to be as active outside the game as they are in-game. <laughs> Computers have historically been a male-dominated field, 
Gaming also started as a male-dominated hobby, but this too is no longer necessarily true. I think that uh, both men and women are attracted to the camaraderie and the storytelling, the interactive storytelling elements. And I think that even though it's been something that has been stereotypically more for boys or men than for girls or women, um, that women are, are drawn to the same, to some of the same elements. Women have long been the storytellers, um, whether it was you know within their families or within their social groups. Um, it's you know of course it's called gossip in those contexts, but that's been long uh, a tradition in. Um, in women's lives. And so I think this is just taking that to a new level and making it even more entertaining. And so it, it does still appeal to women for those reasons. A 2011 report published by the Entertainment Software Association puts the number of female gamers at 47 percent. And of those women, those over the age of 18 make up 30 percent of all gamers, more than the number of male gamers under the age of 17 who are usually thought to be the majority of the gamer population. The perception that gamers play their games because they can't initiate and maintain successful real-world relationships goes back to the beginnings of the stereotype. A study by Albert Morabian and Susan Ferris at the University of Colorado suggests that communication between human beings is based on visual cues like body language and facial expressions, tone of voice, and language. The majority of communication, however, is done through the visual and tonal cues, and only a small portion is transmitted by the spoken language used. So language itself counts for only a small portion of how we communicate with each other, and the main form of communication in online gaming is typing, which is a language-only method. This means that gamers are talking, relating, and forming interpersonal connections using only a small percentage of a human being's ability to communicate. The fact that real relationships are formed under such a handicap suggests a level of mastery of communication beyond that of many non-gamers. A 2008 study out of Queensland University goes even further, saying that participation in online virtual reality boosts people's ability to socially interact. MMO-like environments were found to improve social communication between strangers, allowing for quicker and smoother discovery of common interests. Dr. Withers agrees. I mean, I think a lot of it is about the social interaction and the camaraderie that comes from, from creating something together. And I think that's something that uh, D&D started, that idea that we're creating a story together. It's a shared experience, not uh, an isolated or individual experience. And as gaming has gone online and has become something that people can share together, I've had students talk about how it connects them with friends that they may have lost touch with otherwise. A commonly heard tale is that of two people meeting online, striking up a conversation, becoming friends, becoming romantically involved, and eventually bringing the relationship face to face. We heard one such story at the gamers meet and greet in Ohio. Yes, simply put, uh, this is my fiance right here. I met her in City of Heroes, so uh, does it have an impact on my life? Absolutely, in, in every possible way. You know, I, I moved from the East Coast to uh, <clears throat> the Midwest to uh, Illinois, and uh, you know, so every aspect of my life has changed as a result of playing City of Heroes in my real life. So it definitely has an impact. And it's, it's a positive. Um, just like Jamie said earlier, I, we both met there, um, and he lives with me now. It's really changed my life, but uh, I'm one of the lucky ones who gets to play with uh, her future husband, fiance right now, um, every night when we want. Uh, I don't ever have to worry about, uh, you know, you're playing that damn game again or anything like that. And it's also just good for the both of us um, to spend time together. It's another way we can, uh, one of the many ways we do, and we get along great. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have met him there. Beyond basic interaction, however, role-playing, like that found in MMOs, is also being used in a variety of other social and professional circles. Dr. Bleem finds that role-playing is a valuable tool for training in several non-gaming related areas. What I do is I present this world as a broader, more invasive, more powerful uh, unit of communication uh, than just a subculture uh, by talking about uh, the role-playing experiences that are offered in military training, in governmental training, in human um, uh, operations training. What is happening is that role-play 
as a, a way of both the training and discovering in many different professional scenarios is not just a choice, it's a necessity. We're what is called a narrative species, and role playing is about the narrative, the, the storyline, and where we fit in the story. And so, what I've done is I've taken the idea of the gamer, which I am, and the gamer world into which I continue to try to fit, um, and shown how it has created a very broad broad base for most of our professional and important endeavors in the species of the narrative uh, group, which is us. Gaming and role-playing also appears to provide additional experience in social interaction and problem solving. This part of the stereotype equates gaming with failure in one's non-gaming life. Research has shown, however, that this perception is also wrong. A website called, appropriately, Gamers with Jobs, asks participants to list their occupation. Almost every possible occupation appears, including computer programmer, restaurant manager, bartender, student, agent, manager of a clothing store, and software engineer. While a lot of the stereotypes about gamers are not accurate, trying to correct them continues to be an uphill battle, since negative stories are the ones that generate the most attention and tend to be the majority of stories aired about the activities of online gamers. Even Dr. Janish, who admittedly has not studied media portrayal of online gamers specifically, has had enough media exposure to the subject to offer an anecdotal opinion. What I have seen, my impression, and that's where we are, and my, my, my impression is that you have folks who are maladjusted. Maladjusted. Miriam Webster defines the word as lacking harmony with one's environment from failure to adjust one's desires.